sending the last couple of days to and fro uh, friends um, who I might be seeing at Christmas. So, uh, uh-huh. so yeah, good. I'm, I'm okay. Good, good. Oh, I've had a busy couple of days. I've uh, done a couple of humongous blogs, which uh, I mean, they're really trains of thought for my own use, really. Um, uh-huh. But they, I mean, they they follow through and they link to stuff that explain some of the stuff that I I'm saying at the well, that I am actually claiming as uh, fairly solid um, truth claims, as it were. Even, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so I, I spent a lot of time reading about the oil market, the energy market. This is following uh, on the swing stuff you're talking about at the beginning of the week and the end of yes, last week. Yes, it's, it's all part of the same thing um, because the we're in the middle of a of a of a reimagining or a a, a, a rehashing redesign of the of the international monetary system there's no no question in mind about that and the central banks of the world are at the heart of what it is that's being done and that there's clearly a um conflict of interests as between the commercial banks and the central banks. And that's complicated in and of itself in that many central banks are actually owned by the commercial banks. Um, so uh, the Fed is a, you know, the perfect example of that. Uh, but of course, then at the, at the top of the lot of it, you have the Bank of International Settlements. Um, and so there's there's a there's a big part of it is that it's sort of a just an internal disagreement um and so that can be a bit of a distraction um but what what is important is the uh the amount of credit which issues from which part of the system and how um, how distributed or how, how much subsidiarity there is in that process. And so this is Pear's point, you know, Pear, Pear. Do you mean, do you mean, um, do you mean uh, and, how much, and Richard Berners. do you mean how much discretion there might be at a lower level in the system? To lend. How much autonomy there is, really? Yeah. Um, OK. Yeah. So. And so at the extreme, there's the idea of a single world currency, which is centrally controlled. And then at the other extreme of that is, you know, lots of currencies, lots of banks, everyone doing their own thing. And and, and uh, the, the as, as usual with these things, if you look at the, the polar extreme arguments, so the upper bound and the lower bound, uh, the set of possibilities that are discoverable will lay somewhere between the two. Um, and uh trying to get a handle on which way the needle between the two is pointing uh is is not easy um But that that's what I've been trying. That's what I've been trying to figure out. Um, 
so that just flashed up i'm not a monetarist i'm a distributist <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, it's It's a really interesting. I, 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 in my blog today, I put a video which I was just watching now when you called, which is called New Types of Currencies for a New World. And it's Bernard Lightier. And it's been uh, put together by a Hungarian guy. Um, and it's basically it says Bernard Lightier's New Types of Currencies for a New World, compilation of original videos that were created for the book New Money for a New World. Uh, and then it says this video has been uploaded by the title New Single Currency for a New World Order. Um, that video's disappeared, which is an attack against Bernard Latier due to its deceptive title. Uh, the core message of the professor has been for the last 25 years that we need more than one type of currency, even on the global level. Uh, the book for which these videos have been created is New Money for a New World on Amazon Kindle. It gives it. So um, I, I'm a keen student of Bernard Latier's work. Um, and so he, he he was a great promoter of community currencies, uh, but he wrote a paper called the, the T-E-R-R-A, Terra as in ground, land, terra firma, terra. Okay. Um, uh, sure. Uh, and he wrote a, a white paper on that, which, which I've also linked to on the blog that I did today. Um, and so after I did this this big blog, following up from a a very long presentation that I did the day before, um, I then basically did a, a a blog after that, just quickly explaining what homatics is that's that's my uh building company and i had a really good call earlier actually with with uh uh one of my business partners on that yeah uh, which which was very interesting and um so it, it, it's kind of as i say my 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 thinking is aimed at coming back to the, the mortgage market, the availability of um, finance for uh, people to buy uh, family homes that are affordable and first homes that are affordable. And that is a subset of all of the problems created by a massively centralised um, model of finance which has just gone completely into overdrive into blowing up asset bubbles whilst leaving small to medium enterprises and the bulk of uh, people that want a, a first home or a new home um, oh, and an affordable one uh, off to one side um, and the the policy aspects and the policy landscape of that is all wrapped up in the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, and the idea of uh, carbon free footprints and all of that. So I did a lot of work last summer on all of those questions. Um, Some of it is coming back, you know, now that you mention it, because I remember last summer when we were looking at uh what you know when you uh, when we were talking about desmond and then mm -hmm. afterwards you mentioned that so we were talking about planning at a local government level those mm -hmm. decisions that get uh, i don't know what the word is but they they go up and down you know to the mayor to the minister back down mm -hmm. again to the court and all of that stuff and then afterwards you told me that the language of planning in the uk at local and national level is the same as at EU level and comes from the UN. Yeah. And it's not it's not something that I had, but I, I, one thing I was aware of, that there was an obsession with cities that um, became, uh, started to become apparent to me around 2013, and it must be from way longer than that. Uh, city, city, cities, mm. devolution for cities. And also, I remember just being at a couple of meetings just before the 2015 election, where some people who are big in the cities, 
whatever you call it, think tank world, mm. said to me, well, the thing is that more people live in cities than outside cities or something like that anyway. Uh, therefore, if you want to create change, don't you don't even have to bother going in at the state level, just do it at the city level. Yeah, I mean, p politically, that, that, that that's a hugely loaded question. And um, uh, is absolutely central to the current sort of technocratic uh, top-down model, which, 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 which is so typical of the response to the 2019-2020 flu season. What, 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 you know, what, what, yeah, what we yeah. call the, 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 you know, what we call the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, it's 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 the response to that event which I'm interested in, and that event is absolutely correlated with the um, whole world of trouble that the financial system was back in uh, throughout 2019 but also from 2017 onwards um, and the oil markets and commodities markets, which I've been looking at over the last few days, were all bellwethers of what was going on with that. OK, um, and it's it's really reality catching up with uh, a sort of a praxeological um, algorithmic based worldview um, which effectively uh, sees the tail wagging the dog um, and, and, and it's an imaginary tail at that so so you've got an imaginary tail wagging a real dog uh, and, and when you and say the, tail wagging the dog do you mean are you talking about they claim there's a cause and effect but it's actually the other way around this is is this a bit like your um, uh, policy based the, the, evidence -based? Yeah, the whole of the uh, canon of, of, of neoclassical economics and the Chicago School is based upon circular reasoning, tautologies, syllogisms. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it is wishful thinking, religious thinking, uh, justice. It, 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 it's, it's justification of uh you know the most mendacious kind um self-serving and self-deluding uh, so that that's the nits and um stuff power as capital and all of that mm. uh, and i i used to have a client called merchant uh, imri merchant developers when i was a okay. young commercial real estate consultant. I, 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 uh, one of my clients was uh, Imri Merchant Developers um, and I, I, Imri Merchant were a film producer as well. They actually produced uh, Leon the Pig Farmer, which which was a very funny film in the 1980s. Um, and, and the guy behind that was a guy called David Altshuler. And, and David okay. is the guy behind the shard. David built the shard. Um, right now, I think the idea of a merchant developer is something which I'm very keen on because I, 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 I've been sat down and I was kind of thinking about this. Well, yeah, what am I doing? Um, you know, uh, uh, and then it occurred to me that I am a, I'm a merchant developer. I want to create my wares, as it were, affordable homes, and I want to merchandise them to homeowners first time homeowners and affordable family homeowners that uh, 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 and so in that respect i'm you know i i'm a property merchant okay or a merchant okay. developer yeah as opposed to the other type of uh, thing so so i'm not it so in that i'm not a speculator uh, or, uh, 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 uh and i'm certainly not uh uh a, a broker of finance and it's that uh, but of course 
access to finance for my customers is an important thing. Um, and I mean, the thing that made me hit on it, made me think of, of, of David, what, what was um, the, you know, the Merchant of Venice came into my head because I was thinking, you know, just thinking about stuff. I mean, the two plays, Merchant of Venice, Venice and Coriolanus. Um, and and and, and uh, then the other thing then was we had that discussion about the Shakespeare board game that you picked up and you, you had because because I yeah. discovered, I, 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 you know, I know that Monopoly was based and basically stolen. The idea was stolen from someone that brought out a game called the Landlord's Game, which was to explain really? George's views on um, uh, progress and poverty. Um, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, well, it, it, it's a it's a well documented fact. Um, yeah. uh, and and then I found another f game that came out in the 1970s called Class Struggle, which is by a US pro <laughs> professor who, who'd actually brought out a book called Alienation. And he, he's an expert on the, uh, Marx's uh, theory of alienation as set out in Das Kapital. Um, but but he, he 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 had this board game called Class Struggle, which which amused me, um, and I uh, you know I, I, uh, so that's in my blog today as well. And I, I and and when I was thinking about this, I thought about your Shakespeare board game, and then I was thinking about Coriolanus. As you know, I I, I think the Ralph Fiennes film is really good. I think it does the play real justice, um, and by setting it in the uh, uh, context of um, the uh, Roman, oh, right, no, 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 basically the collapse of Rome and the Roman corn uh, uh, riots. What, is, that, is that where Shakespeare's? Um, n no, I don't. I, well, I'm not sure. Is, okay. is the answer to that? Um, uh, so what, what did you mean? You said you were, you were talking about the decision well, to set. It, well, Rome. because a lot of people are. Uh, when they talk about so why did Rome collapse and lots of people have lots of ideas about that some people claim it was uh, uh, it was a problem to do with climate these days or it was a problem to do with over over exploitation like almost the tragedy of the commons type explanation okay. whereas it, it, it what it is is a question of a financialized economy whereby they resorted to tax farming etc uh, and, and it was the culmination of of, 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 of of Roman policies affecting their whole empire that had already resulted uh, a few hundred years before in the Jewish revolt um, when, 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 when Jesus can be found throwing the money changes out of the temple and stuff um, okay. So uh, it's interesting how these events are given a re a re casting or a redoing. It's like when they remake a film. Uh, you know, I, 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 apparently they're bringing out a new version of 1984 brought up to date from a feminist perspective, which is sort of it's, it's very redolent of that that penis paper we were talking about. The, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, but but apparently that's true. Someone is doing that. Uh, uh, if, if Paul Joseph Watson is correct, in, 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 uh, which I'm sure he is uh, uh, about that. But but um, uh, bring it on, I say, bring it on. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's so anyway, like I say, I mean, I, I've had a really sort of bit. I've, I've, I've been reading such a lot, but but it, it's, you know, can I can I just can I, can I just do the, can I just do a quick sum up of what I've taken in for the last few seconds, minutes? Um, you. There are people who are academics who have written books about uh, class, alienation, uh, property, and were seeking to educate people with their books and then did board games. It just so happens that Monopoly is a board game that ripped off one of these things. And the idea of uh, Shakespeare, particularly Merchant of Venice and Coriolanus, to do with how they were set, possibly how they were reinterpreted and the effect that has, was something that you started to think of when thinking of um, your former counterparty in business, David, 
who did Leon the pig farmer and the shard. And you realise that you're a merchant. Yeah, in the, I, I you're wasn't you're actually he, he, he was a client. I, I think I only Sorry. ever Sorry. I only ever sat in two meetings with him. But, uh, so, I mean, David Oldschuler yeah. is is kind yeah. of, you know, uh, you know, he's a bit of a legend. Yeah, he I, 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 yeah. I, I, well, he came to the firm I worked for, and I was yeah. working but what, on. But what, those, I'm, yeah. but what I'm, but what I'm taking is that. Um, you are intending, and I know this anyway, to make plans to build things that will be affordable homes. And so they'll go from them not existing, but existing in your head and then being a plan all the way through to you handing keys over to people who have managed to get finance to get those to, to buy those homes and live there. And in that sense, you're a merchant as opposed to a speculator. And then the perception of merchants uh is one of the things that we're talking about and the different way in which those things can be interpreted yeah so uh I, I, and and it, it's i mean it, it it's kind of uh i mean it's not just me feeling better about what i do for a living that's got nothing to do with it it's it's uh <sighs> And another reason that the, the, the thing came out, you know, we're talking about swing production in oil. OK, um, yeah. another to friend with, of mine to, to do that. That was to do with uh, the US being the surplus, uh, you know, and, and Saudi, you know, the US and Saudi being the surplus providers. Yeah. So um, at one level, what that represents is uh, uh, a merchant that's long in a particular form of stock which has a high price when they say so, so uh, some of my former business partners used to own a uh, 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 it was basically uh, uh, they were paper merchants okay uh, and they specialized in uh, odd sizes of paper that were used in very high quality printing which most people didn't stock uh, but John John Woolard did um, uh, uh, that that business was actually sold to Bunzels, which is a huge global paper merchant. Yeah, I know someone who used to work right. in their treasury department. Plastic bags. Uh, well, Bunzels, uh, 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 the, the, from pulp to to paper to you know the whole nine yards. I mean, um, oh, okay, I didn't realise it was yeah. so widespread. Right? So, so my friend's business was called Tom and Cook, and they were, uh, uh, and there was another. So anyway, they used to be based down in Southwark. Um, uh, 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 it, but, I mean, I digress, but but the, the thing about them as being a mer merchant, uh, in a way, they were a, a merchant that more or less could name name the, the price for the for the slice of the market, which they made their own. And in a way, that's kind of how the swing production of oil uh, works. I mean, the oil market is 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 is, is, is quite complicated, but at a very simple level, OK, um, by influencing the swing production, you can influence the price of the of the commodity. And as I argue, we, we've effectively had a de facto oil uh, oil uh, stroke gold standard based around that phenomenon um uh since from the mid 80s we had it and then when we got to i think it was in 2015 people are saying saudi couldn't produce as a swing producer and that role actually then went across to american shale now that that that's very cork sniffy as a point um but what I think is happening, what I think is happening with carbon trading and, and that as a whole thing is that what it will effectively do is 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 provide the kind of swing control needed to control the dollar standard. OK, against other competitors in the international um, trade field, as it were. Can uh, I just quickly chuck something in again? Mm. You know how there was a European Council meeting yesterday? 
I don't. I, didn't, I mean, I, it's just it's just because I went on to EU Politico mm -hmm. and there are a bunch of different things being talked about. But one of them was the guy in charge of Poland said um, he objected completely to the CO2 trading system. Uh, and to him, he said it amounted to a uh, European energy tax. It was only about a paragraph because it was a tweet worth uh, on mm -hmm. Politico. And uh, you read it, it might be two or three sentences, you read it and you could see that this guy is being characterised as if he's a complete nutter on every level. One, he's blaming CO2 markets for energy prices being high. But two, um, he's also just being depicted as being the nutty guy from Poland. But all I could think was in 2005, when they opened the CO2 market and I was working at EDF Trading and I spoke to some of the energy analysts and stuff like that mm. about six months and a year into the into the market they said oh it was a cold winter we couldn't work out what was driving what whether it was the power driving the co2 or the co2 driving the power and then they turned around and they said to me because of course uh the, this is just a fucking energy tax that no other place in the world would do it and so everyone's just going to outsource their production everywhere else so all i thought was insiders told me that this guy's fucking right and he's mm. been depicted like he's a retard yeah well he's not um, and, and the chances are he's got an important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to tell you that because it had just happened and it was. But yeah, so you yeah. were saying that. This, the well, CO2 I mean, the price... other thing about Poland is is that they've got a lot of coal. Yeah. Um, and it, it, when you start analysing the swing trading aspects or the swing production aspects of the petrodollar, OK, and then widen it out to the energy market and coal and stuff like that. Um, stopping Australia from producing coal, for instance, uh, where coal becomes. It, it, it's not about the CO2. It's not about that it's dirty. It's about that it's a competing source of energy that can upset the 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 finely uh, yeah. tuned uh, currency manipulation which the system that had evolved and was working very nicely thank you so that that system initially was controlled by the texas railroad um corporation or whatever which which is uh so that's all about you know west Tex texas intermediate or whatever um and uh that that worked until peak production in 1970 and and so the swing production capabilities of us domestic production okay led to and into the petrodollar okay where the saudis then had that swing production thing but when other forms of energy um uh became more important because uh because technology changed people used more economical cars the the amount of oil being used went down and and generating electricity became a more important aspect of the economy um so, so it's a it's a dynamic thing right but right now um you know nuclear power coal powered fire stations uh, not really renewables at this point, because I don't think they can produce enough at this stage to, ch to challenge oil. Um, but yeah, Ranjan, can I call you back? Yeah, sure. Speak to you in a bit. Bye. Cheers.